Okay, so this is Stu, and here I am for You Love Yoga Anatomy, and we're here with Prem Khaleesi and the beautiful Bali, and of course in his Sharla that is here set out in the rice fields. And last time I was here, we had no video. It was my first ever, actually it was my first ever interview, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was just audio. So we were talking about some of Prem's early days off camera, and I thought there's such good stories in there. I'd love to come back and uh, film that properly. So here we are again. So welcome, Prem. Thanks, Stu. Great to be back here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, doing this. I, I really appreciate what you're doing and, and how you're putting this out to the Ashtanga community and the yoga world at large. Thanks um, so much. Yeah, there's some, there's some interesting stories here. Uh, my own personal story, my own personal history. Yeah. And um, to be honest with you, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really looking for yoga or uh, a practice. Where were you in those early days? It was, was it Hawaii? No, I was in Southern California. Southern California? I had just graduated from the University of California in San Diego. And uh, I was partying like crazy <laughs> and, and just living it up. And had a beach house and uh, surfing, volleyball, lots of chicks, lots of drugs. So what age was that? This was when I was 20. 20? Yeah, 20, 21 just about ready to graduate and kind of going, oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? And I had somewhat of a track, you know, I had a plan, but it wasn't like, it, it wasn't really calling me. It was just like, oh yeah, I got to go to work now. I'm, what were, I'm you, be out what of were you thinking of doing? I was, uh, I was getting a degree in sociology, psychology, and I was going into education. I was going to teach like grade school, high school, mm -hmm. and I was going to get a credential to do that. And so in the, the summer of 1978, um, I had two women friends at that particular time that were into Ashtanga yoga. And they said, oh, you know, Tony. I was going as Tony then. In those days. Yeah, I, I've gone through many different <laughs> names. There's like different sections of, of people that I know. Some people know me as Tony, some yeah. know me as Anthony. Some Guruji used to call me Raghava, which is like uh, another name for Rama. Uh -huh. And uh, so there's different events that kind of... Did they uh, have a persona? Did each it. name have a persona? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, hey, Tony, you know, <laughs> you know Tony, Carlisi, you know. So I, I had that. I grew up in the Sicilian family and all of that. So I, I had that edge about me. I had that, you know, and... and um, Anyone who's read my, my biography or my book, I put in there like kind of a, a life story history. So I'm going to kind of do a little bit of a repeat about that. But um, yeah, I, I had this kind of soul searching, but in a, in a kind of dark way. I was going after it, but, and I knew there was something in it, yeah. you know, like drugs and all this other stuff entering into alternative worlds and and trying to find myself through that and seeing it was a dark hole mm -hmm. and a black hole and you can get very lost in it and I speak about that and I know I know the reality of, of going deeply into all of those things and I see now that through my own experience of almost 40 years that you can access all this stuff through meditation and yoga yeah so I always tell people that uh, yeah, if you want to go that route, you want to do ayahuasca, you want to do all these things that are, you know, psychedelic and fun. Interesting sidetrack, but, you know, the, the, the medicine, the true medicine is meditation. Get back on track. To get on track and it's, you, you need to source who you are as a, as a living conscious being from that place and not taking a substance to launch you in there and come back and then you're kind of disoriented and going, wow, that was cool, yeah, yeah. but like, how do I do that again? Oh, I take the drug again or smoke the weed or whatever. Yeah. So I was entering into that world. I was experimenting with a lot of stuff very early on when I was uh, uh, you know, young and uh, still partying pretty hard and getting into like recreational stuff, you know, mm -hmm. cocaine and all kinds, there was lots of, coke around that that particular part of southern california, california. very rich area did you ever see the movie blow mm, with yeah, johnny maybe, depp uh, maybe long so time that ago, that yeah. movie depicts that time era right and that whole area and i was right in the middle of that and i was like involved with 
uh, you know, ac actively doing it and, and uh, participating in selling it too to like university students. Right. So and it was like really sketchy. Yeah. But it was exciting and invigorating and cocaine is like, wow, unbelievable. It just puts you in this like zone of like, of like I can do anything. Like you're on the top of the world and then you come down and then you got to do it again. Yeah. Super addictive. Unbelievably addictive. Probably the most addictive substance on the planet. So I was involved with that. And then these two women came to me and said, out of the blue, like, wow, you know, we know you're so athletic. We know you're so, you know, physical and so oriented like that. You would really like this yoga, this Ashtanga yoga stuff that we're doing. And I was like, yoga? <laughs> no, I don't think so. What were you doing? You were surfing? I was surfing, surfing. playing basketball, yeah. you know, on the beach, beach volleyball, yeah. uh, frisbee, body surfing, very physically active, you know, like that, in my body, doing all that stuff. So they knew from their experience of doing Ashtanga that this would be like the hook yeah. to help me because they could see they were really sweet women, you know, and they could see that this would be like my way out. Yeah, of where you were. Of where time. I was at that time and, and going into some really weird shit. So they invited me to this class, but in my mind, I, I envisioned what yoga was. And at that particular time, I envisioned yoga as being for like, you know, women in their 50s yeah. with leotards and weird music. And I remember watching it on TV. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. there was like three channels back when I was a kid. And I saw like this, this uh, Lilius Yoga. I don't know if you know Lilius Full. And, and she was like, you know, the teacher of the day at that time. And um, I, I, I was watching. I was like, ooh, and clicked it really quick. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was my image of yoga. And I thought, there's no way in the world that I'm going to do yoga <laughs> like that. But so why did you go? So they said, you know, it's very physical. It's very, you know, and, and the first class, you're only going to watch anyway. So just come and watch yeah. and see if you're interested or not. I said, oh, all right, I'll, I'll come and watch a class. So I, I entered into this, um, like, amazing, amazing space. It was, a, it was an old church, probably about this big with really high ceilings that had stained glass around the whole thing and it was gutted out and it was a yoga shala. It was nice. the yoga shala in Encinitas. And Encinitas is known for uh, self-realization fellowship, Yogananda. Okay. He lived there. There was a, there's a surf beach that's in Encinitas called Swamis. There's a, an amazing center still there. And I used to go there all the time after I got into yoga and meditate and hang out there. So it had, a, it had a vibe of spirituality in Sanitas. So I went to this place. I opened up the doors, you know, and, and come in and, and uh, wow, it was like all these people are practicing Ashtanga. And it was my source style, so everybody's going at their own pace and rhythm and the breathing. And yeah. I had no clue. I was like listening to this like dragon breath thing going on, like Darth Vader and... <laughs> I sat, I, I, I kind of plopped myself down against the wall and I just was watching and my mouth was like open and people were pressing up into handstands, putting their feet on their head and flipping back over and going into Hanumanasana splits and, mm. you know, and, and these two guys that were buffed and strong and like amazing looking were walking around helping people. It was all very quiet and very subtle and, you know, just moving around the room. And I was watching this whole thing taking place and just going, oh, my God. Wow, this is amazing. And um, it didn't hurt to have, like, all these really hot women in class. <laughs> and uh, it, it, was really, it was really strange, too. Like, at that particular time, there was no yoga clothing. Uh -huh. There was no yoga mats. So there was, was no, you know, yoga yeah. paraphernalia. We did our practice in our underwear. So That's the women crazy. were basically in their, you know, like a swimsuit, like yeah. a bikini. Yeah. And so I'm watching all these beautiful women pre and sweating and the guys glistening. And I was like, wow, yeah, I want to do this. Actually, I want to be a teacher of this. You know, like, <laughs> I, you know so all these things are going through my head like, wow, this is a cool profession. And little did I know I would be into it. So. 
the teachers came up to me and said, so uh, would you like to, to join? Are you interested? And I said, uh, yeah, I'm very interested. I want to do this. And they said, okay, you come tomorrow and you, you make a commitment for three months. I was like, wow. three months? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I just want to try out a couple of <laughs> classes, you know? And they said, no, you have to commit. And I was like, whoa. And I said, how much? It was like really cheap, like 30 bucks a month yeah. or something. So I said, okay. Laid down the money. I showed up the next day and I came in. I'm ready to roll. And I'm, I'm a young buck. I'm ready to roll, man. I'm ready to rock this. And they, they, they sat me down. They spoke a little bit, stood me up and did Surya Namaskara A. I went through Surya Namaskara A, did a little B. And then they said, stop, sit down, take rest. And I was like, I, I got energy. Give it to me. <laughs> no, no, no. You stay. That's it. That's all for today. And I was like, what the and I, I sat back up. I watched the rest of the class. I'm like biting at the bit, you know, like, come on. Every day they just gave me a little bit more, a little, little bit teasing, teasing, dangling the carrot, you know. And step by step, slowly, slowly, I learned the practice. Three months after I'd started, there was like this buzz in the room. There was about 25 of us in this room. There was a buzz going on in the room about Guruji coming. Guruji, Guruji. What's a Guruji? Yeah. What's a, what's a Guruji? You know? And they said, oh, this big, you know, the, the big guy from India is coming and the guy who created this and he's coming, he's going to be here for six months. And if you want to participate in that, you know, get involved. And I was like, all right, sure. And then 25 more people showed up from Hawaii. David Williams, Nancy Gulgoff, David Swenson, yeah. all these heavyweights, you know, Danny Paradise, all these guys showed up from Hawaii, long hair, beards, <laughs> hippies, you know, out of the jungle of Maui. Yeah. And they showed up and the room swelled and Guruji showed up and it was like, wow. And this, this guy that was like my age, yeah. I'm 61. He showed up, he's like 61 basically. And he was just so powerful, so strong, so amazing, his presence. And he just had us just doing all kinds of stuff. and. Wow, we were so sore. He was just pushing and shoving and, ah, what are you doing? Ah. And every day for six months with him. And then in the afternoons, we'd have like conferences, sessions, question and answer. He was like a little Yoda guy. He would go off in Sanskrit shlokas, you know, verses. Yeah. And then he would speak in his broken English and say, you take it to your anus control. And I was like, anus control? What the <laughs> hell is it? You know, he would say these funny things, you know, practice all is coming. It's like, what does that mean? Yeah. You know, and so we had to trust and we had to believe and just follow this man. And he was the boss. After that session of six months, I went to India with my teachers yeah. and a couple other people. We showed up on his doorstep in Mysore, the first group of Westerners to go to Mysore. And we showed up in his little shala. The shala was big enough to hold like eight people. That basically. was the days, yeah, there was not. Was it the downstairs? Was yeah, it downstairs in Lakshmi Puram. Mm. Eight people could get in there. And then he started cramming ten. <laughs> and it was like this. It was mat to mat and two in the middle. It was completely full. Yeah. There was no space to walk anything. Ten people in there, crammed. <laughs> so we were there, six people. There was some room. And he was just like, oh, my God, it was like six people in the room with him in this little incubator. And it was so hot. And it was India. And it was the room was sweating like the room was dripping sweat. Yeah. And he was just like, you know, wiping it off and pushing on us. And there was only six of us. So he was just like working us All hard. The time. And then we would come back. We would do pranayama. And by that time, I had already been like because I was so fit and so devoted and, and I was already quite flexible and strong had you started I already that accelerated way? had you already when you when you were doing the surf and when you did those first classes were you flexible? i wasn't that flexible yeah you were strong relatively but i was strong i was strong i was fit and uh, i'm 21 yeah come on so you changed quick i had so much juice and energy and uh and and what was really weird is that i went from basically off the street cocaine hamburgers, hot dogs, partying, 
to going straight on into Ashtanga Yoga, one of the most intense forms of Hatha Yoga on the planet, and went into vegetarianism, started fasting, started doing wheatgrass, started doing all this stuff, and oh my God, I was purging like crazy, mm. like crazy. And I was in pain, and I was stuff was coming out of my nose, and but it, it like lit me up, and I was excited about like how much clearer my mind felt. And in the beginning, I kept smoking ganja, and everybody else kept smoking ganja. They that was part of the tradition of Ashtanga. Yeah, they were all ganja growers, and um, everyone was smoking pot. It was just part of it. And Guruji totally um, would always put it down. People were always asking him in conference, Guruji, uh, you know, ganja is good smoking, yes? He would say, don't take it ganja. And then people would say, how about soma? You know soma, it's like the, <laughs> the nectar, else. the elixir of uh, Shiva. And he would say, no, you don't take it. You know, everyone went, and, and <laughs> we kept taking it. Something, yeah. We kept taking it, you know, and he would just say, no, you don't do it. And we just said, nah, you old man, you don't know what you're talking about. You, know? <laughs> you take it one wife. Oh, uh, yeah, sure, right, yeah. I had like three wives, you know, um, not at one time. But of course. Over the decades, I've recycled through that whole thing. So very interesting times. And uh, being a Westerner and being, you know, kind of compacted into this whole Eastern state of thought and lifestyle. Wow. Mind blowing. And then being in India, it was like I, I had definitely was, I had my my life before was in India. I was like wow, this, it, this resonates. There's something to this. And every year I would go back. Every year I would, go, I would come back to America. I'd yeah. work my ass off. I'd make a bunch of money. I'd sell my car, all my shit, and go back to India and stay there for six months or a year. I did that for many, many years. Until I got married and started having kids, then it was... Then the commitment changes. Commitment changes, and then everyone needs to know that. Yeah. Stop playing the fucking game. Some of these idiot yogis that maybe are watching this, like doing like being, you, if you're a householder, which was Guruji and Krishnamacharya, yeah. don't skirt your fucking responsibilities of being a father mm. and bailing on it and saying, oh, I'm more spiritual now. And I can't, you need to take care of your family. You need to make money. You need to do it and make your priority number one, your practice for sure. Yeah. But don't skirt your family and all your responsibilities of making money and taking care of them. That's very important. Yeah. He was a householder, so was Krishnamacharya. And this practice is for householders. It's not for people living in the jungle, in the mountaintop. If you want to do that, fine. Don't get married. Yeah. Don't get married. Because you can get be a bit a fanatical, woman. can't it? It's, and there's a split in a lot of people. Hmm. I saw it in myself because I read all the books, celibacy, you know, brahmacharya. <laughs> Give me a break. I'm like 21, 22, raging hormones, <laughs> sexual like crazy. And then I'm reading like, you know, brahmacharya. You have to hold your semen and don't, you know, ejaculate. And you shouldn't be with women unless you're married. And yeah. All I could think of was women. <laughs> you know, it's like, don't think of a pink elephant. <laughs> don't think of a pink elephant. Stop thinking of a pink elephant. That's all you think about. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't really um, like you said earlier about anatomy and learning. There's a certain amount that you get from a teacher and then you have to do self-study, yeah. which is swadhyaya. Self-study and reading books and talking with other people and integrating this uh, technology, the technique, the tantra of hatha yoga. That's what the hatha yoga practice is. It's tantric practice. You have to know about bandha. You have to know about the breath. You have to know precisely what is going on inside of you as you're doing this. You need a mentor. You need someone who's going to be there that has been along the road well before you and knows what he's talking about or, or she knows what she's talking about yeah. so that they can help you. They're your guiding light. That's what a guru is. Now, there's different kinds of gurus. I spoke to you earlier about my Satguru, which yeah. is someone who initiated me into a spiritual path. People like Patabi Joyce and Krishnamacharya, I consider them as Sadgurus. They're, they're teachers of sadhana, of practice. Okay? I consider myself a Sadguru. 
I'm teaching technique, tantric technique, Hatha yoga practice, Ayurveda, breathing, all these technologies that I learned through my teachers. Yeah. And I'm disseminating it that way. So there's real, there's a lot of value in that. And the literal translation of guru is very interesting. Goo is like the sticky stuff. Goo. Like goo. Icky, yucky, sticky, goo. Yeah. Gooey. And a ru is a remover. So a guru is a sticky remover. The sticky stuff remover. Mm. A guru. He removes the sticky stuff. So you can be free and you can see who you really are. So he helps you to remove the stuff. He doesn't physically or she doesn't physically remove it. They show you methods and techniques in order for you to remove your goo. And that's all karmically placed. And we're so caught up in all that. And when we start releasing ourselves of that, we see clearly who we are. And the meditation technique that I learned from, from my Sadhguru is a completely uh, uniquely based spiritual technique of placing yourself in the center of your head not chakra meditation this is this is like the sixth floor yeah he talks about like the six chakras the five chakras below are energetic centers they're energetic bodies and they're they're good for health well-being vitality vibrancy but they're not necessarily spiritual yeah the spirituality begins here right in the center of the head and right up where the pineal gland is when you close your eyes and you enter into that space and you go there that's where the seat of consciousness resides and so you use mantra technique you hold yourself there and then you leave your body you actually leave your physical body and go into an astral body which is very ethereal yeah and can fly and can go through walls and can do all the things that we can do here but on an ethereal space it's very interesting when you start entering into that and you need a guide yeah you need a spiritual guide to enter into that world someone who's already been there and will basically hold your hand and and help you be your friend on the inside and the outside it's very cool were you doing much meditation back in the early days when you were there that those those first visits back yeah yeah you know it's interesting Stu. he Patabi Joyce was a very traditional Ashtanga yogi. He, he felt, and his take on it was, that the, the normal Westerner, especially, was not ready for meditation. Right. It was basically, like a friend of mine called it, mad attention. It's not meditation. So, Guruji's take was like, asana first. You get the body, you know, in order. You open up the channels, the nadis. You work out all that stuff so you can sit still, along with stilling your mind. So the vrittis aren't distracting you and pulling you out. Mm. So he, he felt that a lot of people weren't ready for, for true meditation. Um, I feel that it's important to integrate it in right away. And meditation will be your barometer as far as how restless your mind and body are in the beginning. Because all the techniques are going to show you where you're at. And then as you drop into it, it becomes very passive. And it's very, very um, let go oriented. Mm -hmm. You're just there. And there'll be a pull as opposed to pushing. All the technique of Hatha Yoga and the breathing and all that is like, you know, technique. And you do this and you do that and you do the mantra and you blah, blah, blah. At a certain point, you got to let go of all the technique. And you're just there. And the pull, the pull that you feel that's coming from deep inside you is just pure love. Yeah. It's all love. That's what it truly is. And the experience that we have of love, of beauty, of you know, the, the awesomeness of, of life, it comes in a flash. When we start analyzing and figuring stuff out and doing this and doing that, that's right, that's wrong, you can't do that, oh, Ashtanga Yoga, Ayanga Yoga. That's the mind playing games. The true connection is just simply love. And that space that you hold when you go into that conscious sanctuary is just sitting in the most loving devotional place 
and you're ready to get downloaded and filled up. It's like the image of holding a, a glass right side up in the rain. Mm. Then it gets filled up. If it's sideways, a little water will get in. If it's like that, none will get in. Yeah. So it's how you situate your own vehicle and positioning and connecting with where you need to be. And from there, it's basically like my teacher said, I'm waiting at the train station. I'm waiting at the airport with the tickets. All you have to do is get to the airport right. and then I'm ready to take you. <laughs> that's our job. Yeah. So that's where mantra comes in, focus, concentration. So Ashtanga Yoga can help with laser liking your focus. It's not randomly just going through vinyasa and blah, blah, blah. So these techniques can help to focus in your mind. Yeah. The pratyahara, the withdrawal of the senses, the drishti, listening to the breath. All that contains your energy and it makes you really juicy. And then you use that energy to focus it in one direction like a laser beam. And a laser beam can cut through the, the thickest metal. So that's the kind of focus that you gain with, with doing your practice in the appropriate way. Yeah. Now, everyone needs to know how to do that as a unique individual. So it's very individual. Yeah. Very individual. Yeah. Now, here's where Ayurveda comes in. And that's why it's so important for people to understand and study Ayurveda. And by the way, all this stuff is all already hardwired in us. When I say study, it means just remembering, basically. So what we sense, but sometimes we don't access it. Yeah, Yeah, it's all there, brother. It's, you know, when you start thinking about the, the elemental makeup of, of who we are and how things operate, for instance, in Ayurveda, there's five elements. Mm -hmm. There's earth, there's water, there's fire, there's air, and there's space. And those five elements are operating inside us, and they're operating outside. So when you study the microcosm of this, this unit of, of uh, beingness, when you go deeply into that, then you can understand everything on the outside. So it's an introspection, it's an inside job. And in doing that, you will understand everything that's happening on the outside. It's all perfectly orchestrated. Yeah. And so the, the components of Ayurveda, of yoga, of all this technology, the library that's, that's, that's there, available to us, in the Vedic Akashic records, is available through the in internet. The internet, not the internet, yeah. but that space that I said that's right in the center of your head, right around where the pineal gland is. When you can still your mind and go beyond your mind, you access the internet. And then you can access whatever it is that you need to know at that particular time. It'll get downloaded. It's just like, it's just like you know, going on Google and going, mm, I'd like to know about blah, blah, blah. And you do, do, do. Same, same. That's how it got created. Yeah. How do you think all these smartphones and computers were created? You know? It's from that aspect of someone having an insight and going, hmm, computer, computer chip. What are we made of? We're made of trillions of cells. What is the, what's a smartphone? What do we call it? A cell phone. So the, the main cell is there. That's our honing device. So when you go there, you can connect with the Vedic library, which is all knowledge. Yeah. all information, all the wisdom that anyone would ever need to know about what's going on here and why it is operating the way it is. And when you know that, then you know. Yeah. And there's no question about it. There's no question about it. And with your, I mean, in those early days, you were, you were strong, buff, physical. Now, old fella, you're still pretty physical, yeah? But have you had, it hasn't been, I imagine, a nice smooth path from those early days to now oh, have you had dramatic oh yeah. changes dramatic times that have Still. made you doubt man I, I just went through the most horrendous time ever in my life I had two beautiful kids yeah and um, three years ago my my oldest daughter Shanti died in a in a tragic car accident yeah she was sleeping in the back seat of a car in Europe she was driving with uh, two Italian boys they were on their way to a music festival. She was fast asleep in the back seat of a car, and the boy that was driving fell asleep, 
and they went off a, a thirty a thirty meter cliff. Yeah. And amazingly, the the driver uh, did not die. He went into a coma. The boy that was sitting in the passenger seat, he broke a couple ribs and some other things, but he survived. And Shanti instantly died. Yeah. Radha and I, my wife, we um, we got married in June twenty first. Yeah. Two thousand thirteen. Shanti was there. She participated in our ceremony. July eighteenth. 2013, Shanti died. Mm. One month later. We had just come back from America. I opened up my computer. It was in the middle of the night, and I got an email from my youngest daughter, Mira. And she said, call me immediately. I knew right away that was not a good message. Yeah. So I called her, and she told me what had happened. And from there, I've been in this spiral. It was really intense, dude. It was so hard. One of the first people I called was um, a very good friend of mine, a Vedic scholar, and I was just like, oh my God, what? I, I had to make sense of this. And yeah. I, I, I was like in shock, and I called him and I said, brother, what is going on? Can you, can you give me some insight? I really need some insight from brother. And he said, you're in the process of becoming a diamond. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know how a diamond is made? I said, I don't have a clue. He said, heat and pressure. Yeah. I said, that's what it feels like. I said, let's see. I don't know. I might crack. Yeah. So for almost three years, I went through hell, man. I could care less if I talked. I could care less about anything. I could care less I was married and I had the most amazing wife and yeah. the most amazing life. I was just kind of going through the motions and doing stuff and immigration came hard on us. They were trying to kick us out of the country and they yeah. said we had the wrong business visa, which was bullshit. Everything was happening. Yeah. Everything. And I just kind of, you know, the warrior in me just powered through it all. But I was just like, God, I got to make sense of this. Inside oh, was, yeah. yeah. I felt like so empty and so dark and everyone was confirming it. You know, it's like, it's funny how people will come up to you and just kind of accept it and kind of go along with it and just go, wow. Yeah. Prem, I, I feel so much for you. And this has got to be the hardest thing ever. I heard it's the most difficult thing any human yeah. being could go through to lose their child. And I said, you know what it is. So I bought into it and I got really, I saw how attached I was to Shanti. I was very attached to her yeah. as being my flesh and blood. And she was going to come here and help us. And so the attachments that we have to each other and the attachments to life and the, the kind of ignoring almost of like one day you're going to die. Mm. One day I'm going to die. So that, that, that was like right in my face. I had to take a hard look at that. And then a miracle took place because I was so dark and down and so depressed, basically, that someone sent me an email and said, you have to go check out this man, this beautiful being that's in Chicago. He's from India. He's been living there since the 60s, in the 60s. He went to Harvard and he's like a brilliant person on all levels. You have to go meet him. I was like, all right, this is some kind of weird email or whatever I'll try anything I'll do anything you were in that space where, I was in that space yeah. and I was open and I, I basically had tried everything on my own sitting meditating praying please help crying isolating myself everything <laughs> nothing was working man nothing nothing because I was fighting I was so I was struggling so much in my own little you know little world of yeah. like I got to do this and when I finally surrendered and let go, someone came in my life like him. And I consider him a Buddha. I consider him a divine being, a master who, who is here on the planet. And there's many. There's many divine beings like him that are here to kind of wake us up. Mm -hmm. And I met with him privately, and he just sat with me and just loved me. And just said, basically, in so many words, I got you covered. And enjoy the rest of your life mm. I was like, Whoa, thank you. 
Yeah. And from that point on, I have been. It yeah. just lit me up, and I've been like so ecstatic and so happy to be alive again and participating and sharing. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So and this is quite recent, isn't it? Yeah. You've come out of this hole. Just December, just yeah. this uh, December 2015. Yeah. Not that long ago, man. Not that long ago. So you caught me on the upswing. On the last up time I saw you, you know, I, I can talk the talk. Yeah. You know, and I can pull that off. But now I'm authentically like, wow, I, I'm so, I feel so blessed. I feel so um, appreciative. Yeah. That I have this opportunity to be alive and to wake up and to see why it is that I'm here and what I'm up to and to prepare for my own death yeah and that's what the meditation is all about too he actually calls it dying while living uh -huh. and it's an experience of actually withdrawing the energy out of your body and simulating death the moment of death that's where you go I don't know if you've ever been around someone who's died yeah yeah my dad yeah so did you yeah. you watched how yeah the, the energy kind of slowly went through his feet, his legs, mm. his arms, his hands, all the way up to here. And then they lose consciousness mm. and they go out right there. Pop. So that's the simulation that you do when you meditate, but you stay in the living body and it goes on automatically. We have an autonomic nervous system that performs all the basic functions mm. and you don't have to tell it to do anything. Please heart beat and breathe. So when you do that, it's a deep, deep rest. It's like a deep sleep. You don't need to sleep as much, to be honest with you. You don't have to eat as much because everything's functioning at a higher level mm. and you're getting more prana from the air and the food and everything. It's like amazing. And so I've been blessed to have, uh, to have this, this, this guide in my life and a friend. A friend forever basically yeah and I know that he'll be there and I can feel him inside and um, I know he's my guiding light in this transition of being here and also entering into like the other world yeah. I know this isn't my home this is just a temporary amusement park you know we're here to have fun and have an adventure yeah and the adventure is up and down man it's a roller coaster ride you know, it doesn't get any more roller coastery than than having somebody yeah. die like that. So, you know, it's been interesting, brother. And thank, I, I'm I'm really thankful that I I had what I had in my life, and it worked up to a certain degree. Yeah. And the meditation was the key, the this meditation and the connection and the to connection. the guru. So that so for I mean, there's probably loads of people out there that are in their own dark hole of whatever making. Oh yeah. You know, oh yeah. What are your recommendations for them, having gone I through would what say, you've gone through? You know, um, seek. Mm. Just be a true seeker, not a sucker. If you're a sucker and gullible, you'll get sucker punched. Yeah. There's a lot of shit going on. There's a lot of pseudo yoga and pseudo healing and pseudo this and that. So authentically seek, and you will be found. That's the old adage from India. When the disciple is ready, the guru appears, not the other way around. Yeah. So just sincerely seek and ask for guidance like that and prepare. That's all you have to do is just prepare. And when the time is right, someone will show up in your life to give you like their calling card and just go, hey, welcome. Hey, going home. Time to get nice. out of this. Yeah. Mm. And you just go, yeah, nice. This has been interesting, but yeah, this ain't it. <laughs> you know what much. I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for waking me up. It's basically like someone, someone like coming um, into your bedroom. You're having a nightmare and they can see that and they go, they wake you up mm. and you wake up out of it and you go, oh my God, thank you so much. That was a nightmare. Yeah. So you wake up to a new reality and they're all, and this is not unreal. I could, I could punch you, I could pinch you, and yeah, you'd go, God damn it, that hurt, you know? So when people say, oh, this world is not real, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's real, but it's real on a, on a relative level. And if we think that this is it, we're fooling ourselves. And this is our source of depression and anxiety and fear and mm. angst 
that creates all this stuff that just works our body and makes so much stress and ages us and creates heart problems and cancer and all the other things. So if we can elevate to that level with proper guidance, with the correct technique of, of yoga and meditation, wow, what a godsend. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a godsend. And not a lot of people are, you know, several million people are looking into it, but there's a lot of pseudo yoga going yeah, on. Yeah. There's a lot of aerobic stretching with music and it's fun and interesting, but it ain't yoga. It's not introspection. Mm. It's pulling you more out and it's just, you know, it's fun, kind of groovy, you know, and fatty. For what you want. Is it, from, is it where you're going? It's fun. Yeah. 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 So when you want something more, then you start looking and seeking and so it's all good. Like I said, there's steps and there's phases. Yeah. And you get guided to the teacher and the appropriate method at that particular time. And then you go, okay, I've reached that peak and that person hasn't gone any farther. I want to go deeper, more. And then another teacher. So it's all good. Yeah. It's all good. It's a bit hard sometimes for people to leave a teacher, isn't it? Because you get a certain security of being with a certain teacher can but be it, it can does, be you do meet that time when it's time sometimes to take the next step yeah but you know it's an internal uh it's an internal feeling of like okay i i've done everything they said i've experimented with all the stuff and it just it is there is an ain't it i felt that with the shtanga yeah. this is not the only answer and so in seeking you know different things came through okay. Ayurveda this and that and, and it's not saying that that Patabi Joyce or Krishnamacharya didn't talk about that I just didn't hear it at that particular time yeah you know some teachers will talk about it and you're just like whew, it'll go in one ear out the other and then you hear it through another teacher and then you go ah damn uh, I remember when Guruji talked about Ayurveda and but they didn't he didn't emphasize it yeah and what's really interesting in talking with Manju and just my own observation of the Ashtanga world is that a lot of people came to Patabi Joyce and all they wanted was asana. Mm -hmm. And so they became, they, they basically, I make a joke saying, we all made asanas out of ourselves. Yeah. We got involved with just doing all the asana gymnastic stuff. Yeah. And it was groovy, it was fun, it was interesting, putting my feet on my head and going, wow, this is humbling, but... I'm still not that humble, even with my head, you know, my feet on my head. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, people use all this stuff. And I saw within my own self, I got more ego. Yeah. From being because able to I do was it. doing, because <laughs> I was the shit, yeah. man. I could bust out like some crazy ass shit and people would just go, oh, wow, you're amazing. Oh my God. And it was like, yeah, I am. huh? <laughs> so I put a lot of energy into it. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> Give me some accolades, you know? Yeah. But then you're like, yeah, namaste. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, the, the kooky stuff that we all do yeah. around the, the guru thing. Yeah. And propping all these people up, propping me up, and then I fall off my pedestal, you know, and then you, you kind of, you know, oh, <laughs> uh, you didn't see that, did you? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's yeah. funny all the games that are going on right now with the whole yoga thing. Yeah. And uh, I see uh, my bullshit meter is so I can see it because that was the greatest bullshitter ever. Yeah, that's good stuff. So it's all good. Yeah, it's all good and fun. It's very interesting the, these times right now um, with everything that's going on. And it's 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 very amazing to watch just how the, the, the access of it's shifting like from the east to the west. Like India and China and all these Eastern countries that were so immersed and steeped in spirituality, they're going more materialistic. Yeah. And the West is going more spiritual. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. How it's flip flopping. Yeah, it's rotating around. It's rotating around. It's mm. shifting. So, you know, again, I, I, I see that this world is always going to be filled with the light and the dark and the duality, you know, the Star Wars image. Hmm. There's a light force and there's a dark force and it will always be that way on this planet. If people think that it's not going to be that way, that some glorious thing is going to happen with the planet, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen on this, in this world. Hmm. So we do our best. We love each other. We remind each other. Do your own job to wake up 
and the technology is there and available for those who seek. So the people that really sincerely seek, they'll get their okay. correct download. For the people that just want to chase their tail, there's plenty of stuff to do. Chase money, chase sex, chase drugs, chase this, chase that, and you'll get it, and then you'll go, damn, that wasn't it, and then you're exhausted. No time left. <laughs> and then, yeah, no time left, and then you get recycled. Yeah, yeah. You die, and then you gotta get recycled. Yeah. That's the recycling process. That's the Shiva. Yeah. It's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> go back. Try again. Go back. Try it. Try it as a little insect now. <laughs> or an animal or whatever. Yeah. It's such a blessing, Stu, to be the human the human being is the only being that has the capacity to have free will and to and to seek. Every other being is programmed, instinctually programmed. You look at my dogs, you look at butterflies, you look at how everything is kind of orchestrated. It's on a particular rhythm mm. and it's on a track and you can read into it and you can see it. The sun comes up at a particular time. It, it sets at a particular time. There's a rhythm. There's a ritam it's called in Sanskrit. So if you can learn to read that, you can kind of align with natural flows. But all beings are kind of just in that instinctual robot-like and, and human beings act like robots also. We can get into that pretty easily, oh, yeah. can't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's the distinction. We have the capability, this possibility of jumping off the hamster wheel and, yeah. and awakening to who we really are. And that's, what, that's why we're here. That's the way I see it anyway. Cool. Yeah. I reckon that's a good time to stop. Okay. Stop on a high. Right on. Thanks, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Too. My pleasure. Cool. And yeah. we're going to do, so keep your eyes open because we're going to do a few shorties uh, just on specific things. So keep your eyes open. And of course, come see Prem in beautiful Bali. Or you get around a bit too, don't you? Yeah, we're going uh, to be traveling a little bit more. My youngest daughter is moving to Germany. We're going to do more stuff in Europe. We're doing a little bit in America here and there. But primarily our, our home base is here in Bali. Yeah. So just go Ashtanga Yoga Bali and, and look at our schedule. And, yeah. you know, we're doing all kinds of different immersions and, and uh, things like that. And we have an ongoing Mysore uh, practice, practice room. Morning. Yeah. Yep. And you can yep. hear the nature behind us. It's probably been through the whole trek of the, the wind rustling in the trees and the little... Yeah, the ja jacada, the yeah. cricket. Cricket yeah. things making Yeah, noise. it's a beautiful space. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I, I welcome anyone who wants to come, who really sincerely wants to learn. Yeah. We do we do require a commitment. Yeah. We're not a drop-in, drop-out so center. Yeah, harking back to those early days when you yeah, first exactly. started. Yeah. I mean, we don't make people commit for three months, no. but we make a commitment of at least three weeks. Yeah. You have to commit for at least three weeks. Yeah. Unless you're an advanced practitioner and we know you, then you can drop in for a week or two. Yeah. But we... You know, there's a lot of stuff that we do that we, we need some time to kind of sit with you and be with you to kind of, yeah. you know. Uh, Otherwise, you're at a wine tasting, really, I think. You know, just a sip of this, sip of that. And, yeah, and a lot of people are doing that, and a lot of people get very confused. Yeah. And I'm of the belief and, and uh, a thought of that, you know, don't believe a word I say. That's cool. I often say the same thing when yeah. I'm teaching. Do not believe yeah. a word I say. Test it out. Yeah. While you're here, check it out. See if what I'm saying resonates or not. Yeah. If it resonates, why not use it? Yeah. If it doesn't, I, I could care less. Go yeah. back to what you're doing and yeah. do whatever. Yeah. But please verify it. Verify it. Yeah. And see if it if how it sits true with not. you. Yeah. yeah. See yeah. if it's really true. Yeah. Don't believe you know someone saying do this and then you hurt your knee or you blow out mm. something or you lose your menstrual cycle or yeah. you you can't sleep. Yeah. That means it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Question. so commonsensical. Yeah. My teacher, Ishwar Puri, he said, common sense is so uncommon. And how you get more common sense is here. Mm. When you start developing your intuition yeah. and going there and cultivating that, everything becomes more commonsensical. Yeah. Question everything. That's what I say. Question yeah. what it's they're good. saying and question why you it's think good. what you think. I think I, yeah. I, 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 I honor that. I believe that. I sincerely um, feel that that's an appropriate way to move. Now, one thing in saying that, 
don't just trust your mind. Yeah. Your mind needs to be kind of the vehicle in which uh, things get done. The intuitive place of going beyond the mind, stuff will come through in a flash. And then you know that's, that's true. When you get a gut feeling and a mm. flash, then how do you accomplish that? Then you put your mind and your body in order to like logically kind of play it out. If you, if you kind of analyze stuff too much and going, well, that's right and this is wrong and you do like that and you do like that, and like, you get all screwed you're up. You're thinking it through. You're yeah. thinking, you're, you're, you're overthinking it. Yeah. But, you know, it's a great tool. The mind is an amazing tool, but you have to know how to use it. <laughs> uh, <otherwise laughs> Learn how to use your brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> otherwise it can be your worst enemy. Yeah. It can cool. be your worst. Enemy. We could carry on again because we just like keep going for another. <laughs> oh my God. That's what I mean. You get recycled. Yeah, exactly. You just get recycled. Thanks, Prem. I'm going right. to cut you off because I want to save some stuff sure, for some sure. other things. Yeah, right on. Thanks, man. All right, brother. <laughs>